All right, guys, welcome back. This is the very last video of this series of this tooling pattern. I've really enjoyed this type of video that we're making. I uh, hope you have. It seems like everybody's really been liking being able to tool along with me and spending the time. I know it's been a long, long month, you know, as far as waiting for them and stuff. But, you know, in a lot of our videos, whenever we're tooling, I just kind of skim through it and go through it really fast. It's just for sake of time. I don't want my YouTube videos being two or three hour long uh, segments with all the tooling included. And uh, But I also don't want y'all to miss out on on kind of learning something about tooling as well because most of us that are in leather work have uh, some type of goal to be able to tool especially floral patterns and so this has been a fun video to really key in and focus on the tooling aspects of using using a lot of these stamps and so in this video we're going to go ahead and wrap this pattern up again if you don't have a copy of this pattern or if this is the first time you're watching this uh, series be sure and click the link down in the description to grab your copy all you got to do is put your email address in and you'll have access to it. You can go ahead and grab it, download it, print it out, and you'll be ready to go. So in this video, we're going to go ahead and re-undercut everything or re-lift everything and clean up any of our beveling that we need to because through the rest of the tools that we did in the last video, we may have kind of distorted a few things just slightly and we can kind of do some real fine tuning here and then the final stage will be the decorative cuts um, and this is where uh, a lot of your flow and your motion and 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 direction and everything will kind of be finalized with those decorative cuts so let's get to it and let's get this pattern wrapped up and see how it goes i just added a little bit of water to this pattern just to um just to kind of make our lifting just a little bit easier. It's still been casing in the uh, in the bag, and so it's uh, just about right right now. Um, like I said, I've held case on this piece for the entire two or three weeks we've been working on creating these videos for you. Um, I did mention in one of the videos we did get a little bit of mold. You may have seen some mold too waiting on the next video if you've kept it in a bag. You can also keep that in your fridge, and it'll tone down some of the mold, but mold's going to happen. Um, I don't really worry about it. Uh, the fellow that I learned to build saddles from years ago said that you know you see mold wipe it off and keep rolling uh, mold's just going to happen occasionally especially where we live in uh, central texas it's very humid even in the winter time and it's just one of them things we're going to get mold growing on stuff occasionally um, especially if you're going to leave it setting for a couple of days before you come back to it so um, but as you can see here you really can't see any of it in there by the time we oil and antique this thing um, it'll virtually be gone but we're going to go ahead and start undercutting again we're going to use all four of our undercuts that we did in the very first video so if you haven't seen that back up and watch that one but these are our four Barry King uh, undercuts. Again, Barry calls them lifters, and uh, Barry's a toolmaker, so he's probably more correct than I am, but I've just always called them undercuts. But these are the four that we're going to use, small all the way to the large. I don't know the numbers, but he I think that's the virtually the bulk of what he's got. Um, but we're going to start. We're going to run them the same way we did in the first at the beginning of the pattern, and we're going to run them from small to large. And, but the only difference here is that right now during this pattern set, what we're trying to do is get a really good lift out of our petals and our leaves. And so we're going to go back through anywhere we used them the first time. You know, the first time we basically just trying to get a good little bevel so that we didn't have to catch that with a small beveler. Now we're going to actually go in and try to get some good depth and lift out of it. A lot of that is going to have to is going to be determined by how thick your leather is. This again is a piece of 13 15 ounce Herman Oak skirting leather. And so we can get a lot of depth out of this piece of leather because of the thickness. If you're tooling a piece of five six ounce veg tan leather you you're gonna have to be careful especially with these smaller ones because you can go through the leather and into your rock or your marble or granite or whatever on your tool top so you want to be sure that you're careful with that one recommendation is to put a piece of mat board down or um, something of some type of substance like that put that down on top of your rock and tool on that that will allow you to get the depth but also you're less apt to go through uh, the leather and the mat board and then hit your rock and and mar your tool up so that's something that you can you can certainly try and it does work really good for thinner leathers allowing you to get some some real good depth out of stuff but we're going to go ahead and go in with this small uh, lifter and uh, we're going to put it right there in our again we're going into our scallops here in between our you know the concave portion in between the convex uh, bumps or what i call scallops there and we're just going to relift and get some depth and some deal there now the one thing you don't want to do is go so deep that you shift everything around so as you can see as you can see there how much more depth we've got in there 
but you don't want to go so deep that you 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 narrow up or move your your scallops around these were a lot these were much closer and so i kind of ended up shifting those around just a little bit but you want to try to keep it to where everything stays the same all you're doing is going in and getting getting a little bit more of a lift out of that pedal so if you can see that there you can see how deep i've gone in there versus the other pedal so if you look at this pedal right here versus that one, you can see how much more depth I've got, okay? And it's gonna give you a lot more texture um, to your flowers. And just be careful with it. You can certainly use uh, hand lifters. You know, they, they, make, they make one that has somewhat of a, like a, a uh, edger handle on it, you know, and you can kind of do it by hand if you, if you prefer. Um, I, I just like using using my stamps so those are the the lifters that i'll use but you can see the the amount of depth there so we're going to go around here and do all of our small undercuts again we're, we're being sure to use to get everything done that we can with the tool that's in our hand before we put it down and that way we're not wasting time searching for tools changing tools and that sort of thing so you just want to kind of walk around the pattern and get anything you can from your point of view for turning your work. You can see how much more 3D effect that we're getting by going back now and relifting all of this. Now you can do it one you can do it either way. We're gonna we're gonna relift and then we're gonna go through and do our decorative cuts. I used to do all my decorative cuts and then come back at the very end and relift and uh, i did that for years and i just recently changed the order of that but it it does i'd say it doesn't really matter there's a reason i changed it or else you know there's got to be some reason or else i would have changed it but the only thing i've noticed is on smaller patterns in particular if i'm relifting i kind of mash up or move or shift or close up some of my decorative cuts occasionally and so i've just found that it's easier for me and better for my decorative cuts staying open and fresh is just a just wait to do them until after I'm done with all of my stamp work. So that's the very last thing that I do to a pattern. But certainly you could do it before this. Like I said, if you're on, if you're tooling on fairly thick leather like we are here, you know, don't be scared to, to hit it pretty good that you can get that that final final lift on those pedals or scallops or whatever you're working on because that that lift right there is going to catch some some nice antique if you are antiquing it if you're not you're still going to notice a lot better color and contrast in the tooled piece so we've gotten all the pieces all the scallops uh, with our small ones. So now we'll step up and go to our next size up and get anything that we can with that. Same kind of concept, just wherever it'll fit, that's what we're looking for. You wanna use the biggest tool that you can in the area that you're doing. So we wouldn't wanna use this medium size and you can certainly walk these little bit bigger lifters around a little bit if uh, if you need to just to make sure that it's clean where you're where you're doing that and then we're going to change tools and we're going to go to our next size up and I'm going to walk this tool around and really get a nice deep bevel down in there and on these scrolls you're not really necessarily lifting like you would on a scallop but you are trying to get what i would call an undercut or an area where you get a lot of you know you get a, you get a lot of depth right in there so this looks like it's up off of the leather okay and that's really going to give you some nice depth and then i'll come in and on some of these vines this one's going to work better so i'm just kind of picking like i said if it'll fit and it's not too small i'm going to go ahead and use it there work my way up to the bigger bigger parts and this is also a time as you're meandering around the pattern 
tool in this is to notice little areas of beveling where um, you may need to come back and tighten it up a little bit and clean it up just a little. You may have some stuff that shifted during some of the other tool work and so we want to try to remember those so we can come back in and clean them up. So I got all those with that. Now we'll grab our largest one and just go ahead and do a little, little last cleaning here on all our inside curves of our vine work. Everything is relifted or re-undercut, and so that's kind of cleaned up any of our little curves. You can see the kind of depth that we're getting there. And now we're just going to take our medium-sized beveler that we used at the beginning, and we're just going to kind of clean up. I, things I like to clean up are like these stumps on the outside, especially, just to kind of give a good transfer, you know, uh, a, a good uh, change there between the stump and this vine coming in here, what's on top, what's behind. And so like this area here where this vine set overlaps the next, I like to come in here and just get a nice good bevel right there to signify that this is behind this, you know. And so that's just kind of what I like to do. And then sometimes I'll come through here on these scrolls and just bevel again the very outside of them. That's just going to make them stand up and stand out just a little bit more. And I'll push that background back down in there. Some guys worry about mashing up their bar grounding when they're beveling like this. It doesn't bother me um, if you don't want to see your background, you know, because it does kind of mash it up there right close to the edge, but I, I don't worry about that. The background is not the focus of my pattern, and so I don't, I want it to accent the pattern, not, not be the focal point of the pattern. So it doesn't, for me, it doesn't bother me. So. Um, if it if it bothers you and you don't like doing that, then then by all means don't don't rebevel because you will change your the look of your background um, a little bit there. We've got another spot here where we're overlapping. And right here where this leaf is, I'm gonna very lightly just kind of touch that up. And again right here at the base of the leaf. Like I said, this is kind of the opportunity to go through and just, just, just refine everything just a little bit. Make everything kind of look the way you want it and clean anything up. And so that's our pattern, completely tooled, relifted. We've gone through all the tools that um, 
that we need as far as stamps. Now the only thing left to do is to decorative cut this. And so we're going to go through. Now you could use a veiner. A lot of guys will use a veiner here in this leaf. I personally don't use a veiner there. I carve that with my swivel knife. But it's just because I haven't in the past didn't have a very good veiner and started just using my my uh, swivel knife because it looked a little cleaner nice and thin and uh, that's just what i've always continued to use even though i've got some nice veiners i still just use my swivel knife there but you could certainly come in here and add swivel knife or uh, veiner uh, veiner marks in here um, which is traditional but now we're going to come through and we're going to do our decorative cuts and we'll walk you through that and what that entails this is a uh, berry king swivel knife it's a uh, three-eighths of barrel and then a quarter inch slim blade is what I use predominantly and the biggest thing when you're when you're doing your your knife work or your decorative cuts is be sure that your swivel knife blade is sharp and so that you get some nice delicate uh, decorative cuts that aren't you know just real thick and and uh, and, and pronounced you want you want a nice accent not a, a, a real hard focus on the pattern and so the first thing I'll use to do is my flowers and my leaves and uh, again doing working from the primary elements down into the uh, into the background and so this is where this is all completely your signature everybody has a particular way of doing decorative cuts and many guys can pick out other guys patterns just solely on decorative cut work and so this is where you'll kind of just have fun with it uh, uh, don't go crazy and just knife work all over the place but just try to try to come up with a little signature knife work that 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 is kind of your style that that kind of you know creatively ex is for you to express yourself as far as the decorative cuts go so um, one of the ways i like to do my my petals is just with one single cut down the middle and i usually try to accentuate the curve over accentuate the curve of that petal so this petal is kind of slightly hanging out this way well i'll put a really over accentuated initial line and then i will just fade that back with two or two or three on each side depending on the thickness of the vine and sometimes a little side cut there like that and um, if you haven't seen our our swivel knife practice video that one it talks a little bit about knife work uh, as far as finger carving or, or decorative cuts but i do plan on doing a video in the future of just doing knife work like on the liner of a belt or something like that because uh, decorative cuts are or uh, finger cuts is what some people call them all of those are really nice for um for all kinds of application to make nice belts on their own or uh, accents and saddle seats and different things so those look work out really good but that's the uh, swivel cuts in one flower and so now I'll show you what we do on a leaf all right so on this leaf right here I'll start and I usually do four of them but I'll start right here inside the right up against the vein and then I arc them towards the front um, that's just kind of traditional on this style of, of leaf but you could certainly do them the other direction where you arc out towards the side just kind of depends on you but this is kind of more traditional looking as far as how how those are cut if you're using a veiner here you would set them up the same way and, uh, and carve them forward like that or, or stamp them forward like that uh, much the same way so now we'll do we'll go ahead and finger cut decorative cut all of our flowers and leaves and take your time when you're doing these um, you know stay loose because you want it to be very flowing and and kind of natural looking and not very stiff but you know you want them to look good because they're they're what's kind of accenting all of your work and some guys when they're doing their decorative cuts they'll try to put one in each one of these these little uh, thumbprints and I used to do that when I first started. I, you know, I thought, oh, you got to put something in each one of those. And but no, I don't anymore. It, it it looks better if you just go in and just stay natural. That's part of the petal. These are separate from the petal. These are your accents. They can go do anything you want to do. So just don't don't necessarily have to stick them in in every little scallop that you have or every little thumbprint that you have. You just need to 
You're just trying to accent the flow and the motion and the direction of the element that you're decorative cutting. Okay, so now our flowers and leaves are done. Now we'll work on the vine work. So it's really however you want to do this. Um, everybody's got a little different style. This, uh, everything about the decorative cuts, it, it, there's really no rules. Now you can go overboard in my opinion and, and kind of do a bunch of cross hatching and stuff really excessively. I like the cross hatching on certain things, but, but sometimes you can go nuts on it and just put it everywhere. And usually when we start out, we, I did too, whenever I started, I would do just decorative cuts everywhere because it was fun and it really kind of started adding some motion to the pattern that's what you're going for and so that's its purpose so that's why you get excited about doing it plus you're almost done with the pattern but if you look at a lot of, of other people's tooling a lot of times you'll notice the stuff that you're really drawn to isn't extremely busy it has motion it has flow but it's not extremely busy um, there's very very purposeful where those things are added to and so that would be my only recommendation when you're starting out is try to resist the urge to decorative cut like a wild man just everywhere okay just try to try to be just a little bit on the less than you think it needs so to speak you know less is more kind of and then you can always add more if you get it all carved up and you think well i need a little bit more here a little bit more there you can kind of add a little bit more but if you've added so much and you get halfway through the pattern and think it's too much, you can't go back. Um, so that would be my only recommendation if you're new, if you're new to carving is just to um, be mindful and deliberate about where you are putting your decorative cuts. And how much of them you're using. But now when I do my vines, so like on something like that, I never really know how to do these. Um, these little fold over ribbon type vine uh, stops like that and I usually just go in there once and come out with one cut one one cut in there that seems like plenty to me and that's kind of one of those situations where I could probably do a lot in there try to put a lot in there but it's probably just going to take away from the from the element itself so I just here lately last couple of years I just put one in there and that seems to be plenty um I may change that as we go along, you know, throughout my career, but right now that's what I'm doing. When it comes to just a normal vine like this vine right here, this is the cut that I normally do. And it's not necessarily mine. Everybody, a lot of people do it that way, but um, I kind of got crazy with that one. I kind of got some overcut on that. But, uh, but I'll do one cut, one long cut that follows this long line, okay? I'll do one like that and then it kind of tapers out. Again, you'll carve these like you were carving this pattern, deep at first and then start to fade out at the end. Well, you'll do the same thing here, deep at first and then fade it out to nothing as you stop. So as these two lines come closer together, we're kind of pulling up there and, and letting it fade out. And then I'll do one little short line. So it's basically the same structure that the vine is, a long line and a short line. So if you've read, uh, we shared that article recently on Facebook, but it's also on our website on uh, drawing vine structure. Each vine has a long line and a short line. That's basically the way I do my decorative cuts. I've got a long line and a short line. And so find a spot here. So anywhere, you know, no matter how curved it is, I'm doing the same thing. So there, short, long line, short, long line, short line, long line, short line, long line, short line. And so that's usually, usually just, just enough. It's just a little accent there. When you antique that, those two lines are going to stand out really good because you've got antique down in them and it's really going to look nice and add some good motion to the pattern. Again, when it comes to casing, you want to be sure that your piece is cased up properly and that was getting a little bit dry and so your um, decorative cuts can drag just a little bit. So we wanted to add just a little bit of water, a little bit of moisture just to allow us to get a good, a good clean cut. Um, you also want to be sure that you're stropping your blade uh, frequently. I use just a, this is just a wood block. You can use any kind of wood. Um, you know, it's made into like a paddle and we'll probably do a video on strops and uh, different sharpening techniques at some point. 
but and then it's just a piece of leather here with the rough outside up and then um, some black compound on there you can use green or red whatever compound you want i just use black on everything in the shop so i don't have to buy multiple types but and then you just run your blade across it there and we've got a video on sharpening your swivel knife as well that'll kind of talk about that a little bit but you want to be sure your knife is nice and sharp and uh, maintained while you're doing decorative cuts especially now when i get to stumps find a nice clean stump like this stump right here when i get to these these again you can come up with your own way but i do it um i kind of do two long lines so one there and one there so i've got that one and then i've got one here that kind of start they're kind of staggered so one comes in at the bottom of the stump one comes in at the top and then i'll take the bottom one and just connect it there and um, again, there's lots of ways to, uh, to make that happen. There's lots of ways to, to go about doing it, but that's just how I do it. So on scrolls, how I do it is I'll start here at the top and I'll make me a cut and I'm following this inner line and then I'll stop. Okay, so I've made one cut here and then I come around and I just float it out to nothing there. Now we'll come in above right there at the end where that stopped. We'll come in ahead of that just a little bit and then I'll bring this around. And you want to kind of try to do this in one pass. You don't want to have to do like half and then move your work and start. You want to kind of be able to, so you need to get to where with your swivel knife you can kind of push that knife too so that that looks fluid and nice. So this one comes ahead of where it ended there a little bit and then comes all the way around and then I'll come in and connect these two like that. That's how I usually decorative cut my, uh, my scrolls. Now if they're really big scrolls and they make a couple turns, I'll have a few of these around. So I'll go around a long way and they get a little bit longer as I go around the, the scroll, but I may have two or three of these little connection points. So these will be two or three different line segments as I go around that big curve. I won't do just one straight line all the way around the scroll. I'll kind of break it up into segments. But on this little scroll, that's about all it needs. On those pods, I've been putting a little bit of carving right in there just to just to give it a little bit more of an accent. But you certainly don't have to. You could also use a pear shader in there and uh, and give it a little bit of burnish down in there with the heel of a pear shader at the very tip. And again, this is your last chance as you're working through the pattern doing your decorative cutting. If you see something that you missed, a piece of background or something that needs a little touch-up beveling, or maybe you forgot to bevel it all together, this is the time to grab it because after we do this, the pattern is done. So um, it's kind of better to catch it now than whenever you're putting your final coat of sealant on it. And the patterns or the the piece is dried and you know you don't have any case left and then you've got to re-wet it and step back so just kind of have your eye open for anything you might have missed because you're you're going over the entire pattern when you're doing decorative cuts and it's a good chance to be sure you didn't forget something and i still do many times All right, guys, so that's our pattern. We've got it completely done. We, uh, in this video, we wrapped everything up with it. We relifted everything and we did our decorative work, our decorative knife work. And so now when you look at this pattern, you can hardly even see the background. Like when you look at it, the background is really in the background and that's because of all the texture, the uh, accents to motion and direction that we added to everything in the foreground. So like I said, when you're drawing patterns especially, and you think 
man, it looks like a lot of background after you've drawn it and transferred it and beveled it and background it. And now you're like, that is a lot of background. Just keep going. Don't stop. Because by the time you get to this point, it looks extremely different. So if you'll go back and look at the uh, second video when we did the beveling, after we got the beveling and backgrounding done, look at that pattern compared to this pattern. And they don't even almost look the same because you, the background is so um, minuscule in this pattern now versus at that point. But so that's the video. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, that's the end of this series. Uh, thank you for following along with us. I hope you uh, you got something out of it. Let us know what you think about this type of video, either in the comments or, or shoot me an email and let me know. Everybody seems to be liking it. We may do another one of these in March. And uh, and then that way we'll we'll do a different pattern. Maybe we'll even do some figure carving or, or just uh, some other different types of pattern, different types of flowers and leaves and setups and stuff. But these are kind of fun. If, you, if this is the first time you've seen this video, be sure and uh, grab the pattern. It's free down in the description. There's a link. Just click on that in your email address and you'll have access to that. And then you can transfer it and go back and watch all four of these videos in a row and uh, follow along and tool, tool this pattern completely. So I really appreciate y'all. Be sure and subscribe to the channel. And if you have an idea for a tutorial or something you're having trouble with or maybe just something you'd like to see me make, let me know because we're always looking for content ideas and stuff. And uh, we've got a pretty heavy load for uh, 2019 of content that we want to produce and we'd certainly like to hear your ideas so thank you all very much be sure and subscribe to the channel and uh, we'll see you in the next video